to include contracting for the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative funds uh, and working with the defense industry. And again, that's something that we've been talking about for the last few days, and I know you're interested in that. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. LaPlante has a, a, a hard out here, so I'm going to stop talking and let him uh, go to the podium. He's got some opening comments, and then we'll take some questions, but we've got to get him uh, out of here about a quarter after the hour. So with that, sir, thank you so much for joining. Good afternoon. Thank you, John. Hi, everybody. So I'll make a few remarks here, as John said, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, so thanks again for being here. So. Uh, I do want to provide a couple of updates uh, before we do get into the questions. Uh, some things on contracting and uh, other funding for key systems. I think the last few weeks have really highlighted the int intensity of conventional conflicts now in the 21st century and the demand for munitions and weapons platforms. It really outpaces anything we've seen in recent memory. As I'm sure you're all aware, the Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act was signed into law on the 15th of March. Of the $13.6 billion when that, uh, in that appropriation, $3.5 billion was appropriated to replenish U.S. stocks of equipment sent to Ukraine through the presidential, it's called the presidential drawdown. Okay, following the required 30-day notification period to Congress, the first tranche of funds, roughly $1.45 billion, were trans was transferred to the Army and the Marines earlier this week to procure replenishment stocks of stingers, javelins, and other key components. We are actively negotiating right now, the Army is, for stingers and related components, and that's ongoing. Expect to get that awarded by the end of the May. For javelins, the award is imminent. So that's all happening right now. Now, in the second supplemental that's been requested by the White House, that's been gone over, uh, that's the 33 billion request supplemental. 5.4 of that would be for additional replenishment. So again, 3.5 was approved before. Uh, we're, we're asking in the next supplemental for 5.4. Okay, the second item is a security assistance under authority provided by the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, or USAI. Unlike presidential drawdown, this is an authority under which the US can procure capabilities directly from industry rather than delivering equipment out of our stockpile. So it's a different category. Um, on April 1st, we announced $300 million in security assistance under USAI. And to date, the DOD has already awarded eight contracts, totaling $136.8 million. And we'll have some of the details of this if you're interested. But these awards included unmanned aerial systems, Puma, advanced precision kill weapon system, communication devices, com combat medical equipment and supplies, meals ready to eat, even binoculars. So again, um, this also includes a 17.8 million for switchblade unmanned aerial systems. And that's a war that's gonna be seen later today, uh, and later this afternoon. So again, uh, out of the 300 million, we have plans for all 300 million, but we've announced already the, the, the awards for 136.8 million. I want to highlight that, again, this is in the next supplemental, an additional $6 billion was requested for USAI in the supplemental uh, appropriation, which again provides capability directly to Ukraine and s sending a clear message to industry, a demand signal. So I'll close by emphasizing that we are in contact with industry every day as our requirements evolve and will continue to utilize all available tools to support Ukraine's armed forces in the face of Russia's aggression. As we work to mitigate supply chain constraints, speed up production lines, get contracting underway, we have also asked the industry to present options for new systems that can meet strategic objectives. Uh, we did put out a request for information about two weeks ago in different categories of time frames, 30, 60, and 90 days, to industry and what they could provide. We've received and are looking at well over 300 proposals, and we're going through those right now in this book. And, uh, and so there's a lot of work going on. So I'll stop at this point, and we'll go to questions. Thanks. I'll, I'll go ahead and moderate the uh, Ben. Is it like a one-to-one -one replacement? So the 1,400 stingers that went out the door, do they, do you just, 
does the U.S. reacquire 1,400, or is there, uh, are you getting more above that number? It's, it's not that simple, at least for this first tranche, as I understand it, because it depends on the system. It depends when the system was, uh, you know, the system that we're replenishing. The intent is to eventually go to a one-to-one replacement, but it was, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, the intent is to eventually get to one-to-one. But it, it, the, the, re- the reason it may not be directly one-to-one in the first tranche is it just depends on when the system was bought and, and, and buying it today. But the intent is to get to a one-to-one with between a combination of these replenishment funds. Hey, uh, Tony, I think you're on the phone there. You want to ask a question? Yeah. Hey, th- thanks, Jen. Welcome back, Dr. LaPlante. I have a quick question for you. Uh, a DO and DX rating programs, a lot of industry are asking for this DO rating, and some are even asking for the DX rating, the highest. What's the status of that? Are any programs being reviewed for that any new programs are being reviewed for those designations because of ukraine first question tony well there's always they're always looking at the programs and making sure particularly the do list is up to date um many there are many programs already have do designations and so and we've already been using this as a this is for title one this is for the rest of you had defense production act title one which is basically prioritizing uh, defense equipment over, say, a, a commercial item. So we're, we're, we're always looking at DO. D, DX rating that Tony referred to is we, we really reserve that to a very small category of things, and we have not, we have not any plans to change that. We have not changed those, what's in that, that DX category. Warren. Uh, as I'm looking at this list, and, and you detailed um, a, a bit about this, but the only, the only one we've seen announced under contracts, if I'm not mistaken, is the Pumas. You said the switchblades would come uh, later today. Why haven't we seen the contract announcements on the ones that are over the seven and a half million? And then I'm just curious if you can detail what 45 million in transportation yeah, it is. It should have been anything that was above seven and a half million should be announced, should have been on Fed, should have been announced. So is there something up there that's greater than seven billion that was not announced? Seven million, excuse me. We'll, we'll find out why that is. Okay. Yeah, I just I don't know the answer, but it should be. You're right. The, the threshold is seven million. Everything above seven should be announced. I've just checked. You know what what is obligated to Ukraine. Just haven't seen anything since the 300 million announcement. But I was also wondering. You said you have plans for all 300 million. Yes. Is it more of what we're seeing here? Is it different systems? And then what is the 45 million in transportation? Okay. The answer is more and different. Yes and yes depends. I mean everything depends. The 45 million for transportation. That's government. That's for the government. That's for us to actually for things like DLA and Transcom to get the equipment over. That's that what that pulled from the USAI. It's out of the 300. Power. You take 45 off the 300, and then the the rest is the, are the are the systems. And so 136, you add, you know, and you add add to it 45, and the and so we still have that delta that we're going to announce between that and 300. Jen, a couple of things. You mentioned the switchblades. There's been talk about the switchblade 600s not being delivered. Why have they not been delivered? Is it a uh, is there some block to the procurement? Is it because they're not available yet? Is that being fixed to get them there? Yeah, so let me tell you what I know about switchblades, and we'll get you the answer on the specific part of the 600s, because I'm not sure I can answer that other than an educated guess, and I want to get it right. But here's the situation with the switchblades overall. You may have seen the number 700 overall. Okay. What it is, is my understanding, is there was 100 or so in one of the earlier tranches that were taken directly out of our inventory. Okay, so that was under under the, uh, the basically taken from our inventory. There is another 300 or so, right? This is, th- this is uh, 300 or so that are coming from a combination of places, but I think the 300 is what we're putting under contract. Is that correct? That's because they have a hot production line. So we're able to put that under contract. And then the remainder, I think, is others that they may have in stock that we're doing. So it's a combination that adds up to 700. So we're using two different authorities to do it. I'm not specifically sure about the 600s. We'll get you an answer on that, on why. I assume that's in that first tranche that was supposed to be delivered. But we'll get you that answer. Yeah, they haven't been delivered. Um, the, so in terms of earlier this week, the Taiwan defense minister said that uh, they've been told that there's a backlog um, of deliveries for the howitzer, the self-propelled howitzer. Is there a shortage because of Ukraine? Is that affecting weapons shipments to Taiwan? Um, not that I'm aware of. No, let me see, a reminder, this is the M777s we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, M777s are what were delivered to Ukraine. These right. are a slightly different version. They're the Paladin um, howitzer uh, for Taiwan. But there was a link being made in news reports 
about that it was a shortage as a result of Ukraine. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, Jim, we've talked about this. This is a separate. I, I understand, but it's a separate. It's a separate, uh, a completely separate transactional process. Yeah, it, it, there's, it, not, there's not a correlation. I wouldn't see a, a way that they would be connected. I could see trying to connect it, but I don't see those. I don't think those would be connected. They're not, David. So we had uh, been told that in, in uh, replacing these uh, stock bonds. That it didn't. That the stockpiles didn't necessarily have to come back up to the previous level because those stockpiles had been acquired, you know, years and years ago yeah. when warfare was different. Sure. But I came in late. But I thought I heard you say the intent is to replace on a one-for-one -one basis. Right. To the extent that to, it, it depends on what one-to-one -one means, and I'll give you an example of exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the, the model of javelins that are on the production line right now are called the F model, okay? This is that Lockheed Martin makes. Uh, the plan all along before Ukraine was to transition to a next generation of javelin, better, better uh, seeker, better range, etc., called a G model. And so, of course, one of our decisions to make, and when we replenish it, do we want to replenish it? Probably we will with the G model. So it's not quite a one-for-one -one replacement. Now think of some some other systems that are much older than that. You have a, it's it's going to be harder. For example, the M triple sevens is an example. You know we don't have that in production anymore. So what do you what's the replacement equivalent for an M triple seven? And we're going through all of these calculations right now. So it, it's one for one to the best you can do, or the equivalent of that. Uh, but this is the issue that's happening. We're we're having to go through this calculation. And so are the Europeans, our allies, which is if they're replacing, for example, the Poles sending uh, Russian-made originally tanks. Um, what do they want to replace them with, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just, everybody's going through the same calculation of what is the replacement. John, John, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, are you looking to buy any additional Phoenix Ghost drones through the USAI fund? I'm not aware that we're looking to buy them, um, but if, I think well, I'll just say this. In many of these contracts, uh, they're, they're, we use what's sometimes called a indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, IDIQ is the terminology, which has a, it's a contract that has a ceiling on it, but that you can put individual task orders against it. The nice thing about that is if later on, you have a contract already set up or a e pretty ready mechanism, if you want to go back and buy more of something, even more than we originally planned, it's pretty straightforward to do it. I'm pretty sure we are, will have that arrangement in, in that case, to, but it also depends on each system is different. Is it in production? Uh, what 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 systems are being are, are are being still in our stockpile, et cetera? And then, just more broadly speaking, are you looking to uh, boost uh, U.S. inventories of the Phoenix Ghost? That I can't answer. I, I we can find the answer to that. I don't know. It was uh, Phoenix Ghost was made. If you know, we're executed by the big safari office in the Air Force. If you know anything about that office, they do lots of really great fast type work they were very active uh, during afghanistan and iraq and sometimes they just and i don't know the, the answer to it and we'll find out but uh it, it just depends on what the operational needs are there are lots of uas systems there are lots of uas systems and each uas system does something slightly different but i don't i'll, I'll find out the for you the answer to that uh, tony bertuga do you have a question I do. Thank you, Mr. LaPlante. Um, in the uh, $33 billion supplemental that went over to Congress, there was a $500 million request for something called a critical munitions acquisition fund. There was also a $50 million request for a defense exportability transfer account. Can you tell us what those things are and, and what they're going to do? Because I assume your office is going to run them. So I think they're, well, they're both generally to try to help us in a, the situation that we find ourselves in is a situation that unfortunately happens periodically. It's the third time in my adult memory since 2000 that we've had this happen where all of a sudden we find our production lines to, to, to have to be boosted up. First time was after 9-11. What happened is, if you remember, we went into Afghanistan in October. Well, by December, late December 2001, we were running really low on munitions because we hadn't planned, we was 9-11 had happened, hadn't been planned, budgeted in. Uh, those munition lines got hot, stayed hot for a long time. But then as we did the drawdown in Afghanistan and Iraq, or thought we were going to certainly draw down in Iraq about 2014, same, same thing, we, the budgeteers, we always turned the production lines down, and then the ISIS fight, and the ISIL fight happened. And, and right, we were scrambling in the same way we are now. So you can't, the idea behind the fund and the exportability piece, it's an idea, it's not a new idea, 
but it's one that has basically almost a working capital or a replenishment fund that we can have a continuous stockpile. Because we can't predict exactly which weapons are going to be needed. We're not going to predict what the next surprise will be, but at least find our way not in the same situation. Because that's why munitions go up and down. Because when the peace breaks out, the budgeteers turn down the knob, the production lines go quiet, and then unfortunately, when events happen, they're often a surprise, and you find yourself in the same situation. So it's a way to, uh, to hopefully build up a little bit of a buffer for the next time. Tom? I wanted to follow up on that. Um, how has the Ukraine war changed your assumptions on what kind of stockpile is necessary? And at this point, you know, Ukraine has been using a lot of munitions, very rapid pace. Uh, how close are our stockpiles to the point where um, you wouldn't be able to push more forward without putting our own stockpiles at risk? Well, it's, uh, it, that is the, that's the calculation that's being done every day, and it's really a trade-off between uh, readiness and modernization. It's something that the, the, war, uh, the war fighters and the, the services are experts at this. They had to do it during sequester. In that case, it was you have a, you have a funding cut you didn't think you were going to get. You know, and you can only take the money from certain places. Well, where did they take the money? Fungible money was in ONS. It hit training. What happened? Readiness went down. But that was a risk that was taken at that time to try to protect some of the modernization, the new stuff. So exactly those calculations are going on right now, where the warfighters are looking and saying, how much risk am I really to take on my readiness? You know, and then at the same time, we're trying to protect our modernization. Here, the constraint is really time, and the, and the variable that is hard to figure out is time. Um, but I will say this about, there's a lot of lessons being learned right now. I said at the very beginning of my opening statement about uh, this, is, this is pretty unprecedented, the amount of munitions that are being used right now and have been used in the last month, month and a half. So I'm sure we're all going to be reexamining our assumptions. I, I do believe uh, in, the, in Europe as well. I was at the NATO with our NATO partners talking bilaterally, not as part of NATO, but talking bilaterally. It was happening at a NATO event, and everybody's going through this calculation, you know, so. Just as a quick follow-up, is there assumptions that future conflicts might look more like this one and less like what we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan, where there would be more precision-guided munitions, where there would be more need for drones, and that's how your, your assumptions are changing? I, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't be able to say that. I'm not sure that, I've, certainly I've not been in those conversations about what assumptions we would make about the future. Um, I, 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 you know, the U.S. military has to plan for almost every contingency. And, uh, and so that's the thing we have to remind ourselves. We have to remind ourselves of Secretary Gates, what he said about our prediction record when he was Secretary of Defense. We had a perfect record. We were 0 for 9. So uh, it's, it, the prediction business in our world is, 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 is one that we have to do it. It's the best practice. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's always to, to rely on saying this is what's going to happen next or likely to happen next. Clearly, we're learning stuff right now, and I'm sure it's going into the calculations. Um, I'll just stop at that point. Yep, I'm afraid we've got to run out of time. We've got to let Doug go back, head off, and then uh, we'll pick up with the rest of the briefing. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Okay, I probably should have raised the podium for Dr. Plant. <laughs> it's set at Kirby height, but it's all right. All right, uh, that was my opening statement, was him. So uh, so we can get right to questions. Ben, you got one for me? Uh, return to the Moscow. Um, are there any restrictions that you can talk about um, that the U.S. would impose or include on Ukraine in its use of American intelligence so as not to you know, risk further escalation of the conflict. And then there's, secondly, there's a report out there about a second patrol ship, Russian patrol ship that's been struck. And if there's anything at all you can say about that. Yeah, we've seen the reports about this uh, second. I think they're saying uh, the, re the reporting out there, at least in social media, was a Russian frigate. Uh, we've been looking at this all day, and uh, we have no information to corroborate those reports. On the intelligence, I think you can understand, I'm going to be careful here in what we talk about in terms of uh, the parameters of intelligence that we provide them. But um, we provide them uh, what we believe to be relevant and timely information about Russian units that will allow them to uh, adjust and execute their, their self-defense uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, the kind of intelligence that we provide them, it's legitimate, it's lawful, and it's limited, uh, and I would rather not get into what 
uh, uh, you know, the degree to which there's limitations on there, but we try to be as, uh, as timely and as relevant as we can. And I would also add, and this is not an unimportant point, we are not the only sole source of intelligence and information to the Ukrainians. They get intelligence from other nations as well. Um, and they have a pretty robust intelligence collection capability of their own. I mean, they've been fighting this war against Russia for eight years. It's not like they are co completely blind to the way Russia organizes itself and the way the Ru Russia conducts itself on the battlefield. Um, so, as you would expect any nation to do, they, they form a mosaic here. Uh, they collate the information that they're getting, and then they make their own decisions about what they're going to do with that. And if they do decide to do something with that in intelligence, then they make the decisions about acting on it. Yeah. Andrew. Just on, I think when you were talking to the networks earlier today, you said the U.S. did not know beforehand that the attack on the Moscovo was going to take place. I'm just curious, generally speaking, when the U.S. shares intelligence with the Ukrainians, does the U.S. ask what it's going to be used for, or is it just sort of handed over and said, do what you yeah, again, I, I, I want to be careful not to get into the specifics of the intel sharing. I think we can all understand why um, it's, not, it's not good to have an open discussion about intelligence sharing. Um, I, I would just go back to what I've said before. We try to provide them useful and relevant, timely intelligence so that they can better defend themselves. Uh, but ultimately, they make the decision about what they're going to do with that information, if anything. So they don't give you a heads up saying, hey, we might... We, we don't routinely get... Um, no, we don't get... Um, uh, you know, we, we don't get heads up about their day-to-day -day operations, nor nor do we expect to. I mean, they're, they're in an active fight. But I guess if you're getting specific intelligence, why not ask, hey, what are you going to do with this? We, we are... I'm not, again, I'm not going to talk about the intelligence sharing process any more detailed than that. Uh, so we provide them useful, relevant intelligence so that they can better defend themselves. Um, and but they have they are under no obligation to uh, to tell us um, uh, how they're going to use that information or when and where, uh, if at all. Okay, yeah, Tar. Have any changes been made to U.S. force posture in the area? Um, just in case there's retaliatory moves by Russia uh, because uh, I of think the you know we don't talk about uh, force protection measures that we take anywhere around the world. Um, I can just tell you that uh, uh, that uh, we still have now more than 100,000 troops in Europe on rotational and permanent orders. They're still doing the jobs that they were doing before in the air, uh, on sea, uh, and certainly on the ground. And um, and we're always monitoring. Uh, uh, their force protection protocols and posture to make sure it's appropriate. But I would not speculate one way or the other about, that's not even speculation, I wouldn't comment one way or the other about uh, what force protection protocols we put in place. Yeah. Just separately, the Lynn Lease Act was supposed to be signed into law in the coming days. Um, can you can you talk about how that's going to change things here at the Pentagon? I mean, they say it's going to make it easier for the U.S. to get uh, equipment and weapons to Ukraine, but what does that actually mean? Yeah, I, uh, we've talked about this a little bit before. It's not signed into law, and so until the, uh, and, unless or until the president decides to sign that, um, we're going to refrain from commenting on it. I would just back out a little bit and say, number one, we really do genuinely appreciate the support that we've gotten from Congress to allow us to continue to support Ukraine. And the president as you saw just last week, asked for another $33 billion, $16 billion of which would affect the department specifically. Um, and as you heard the secretary say, we urge the Congress to act quickly on that so that we can keep providing this support in an uninterrupted way. Um, additional support uh, legislated by Congress and approved by the president certainly is going to be helpful. Any additional support that we can provide Ukraine is going to be helpful. But I'm going to refrain from speaking to the specifics of that uh, of that pending legislation unless or until the president signs it. Yeah. Uh, John, a separate topic. Uh, last week, Greece has violated Turkish airspace for about 30 times, uh, which mounted the tension in Aegean Sea. I wonder what's your take on this uh, as currently, while the NATO is united against Russian aggression, uh, this tension is mounting. In I, don't have, I don't have any knowledge of those reports. Uh, so I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll take the question and we'll see if we have any context on this. But before I make a, a, you know, some sort of a pronouncement here on, on what you're claiming happened, I, I think it'd be better if we just get ground truth here. And I just don't have any 
way to corroborate those reports. Uh, also, like the, of course, it's a decade-long tension, actually, dispute between Turkey and uh, Greece. Greece. Greek claim that while their territorial water is six nautical miles, the airspace is ten nautical miles. They claim they claim the ten nautical miles of airspace. What is the U.S. position? Can you just yeah? yeah let me take the question. I, I, I'm not. I I'm, I wasn't prepared to talk about. Greek or Turkish airspace requirements here today, so I'm going to take the question so that I don't waste your time or, or, or you know, any, any more on the today. Uh, yeah. An update on the uh, training of Ukrainian troops in Europe, what the latest is, how many, what weapon systems? Um, yeah, hold on just a second. Uh, let's see here. I know it's here somewhere. Just hang on. Hang on with me. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. So, as of today, uh, more than 220 Ukrainian uh, soldiers have been uh, have completed M777 training. There's an additional 150 plus that are currently going through howitzer training. Uh, 15 Ukrainian soldiers have completed the Q-64 training. That's that mobile air defense radar system that we talked about. Um, 60 Ukrainian soldiers have completed M-113 training. That's the armored personnel carrier. Uh, and about 50 uh, more are uh, currently being trained uh, on that right now. So that's it. Yeah, Jen. John, earlier this week, General Milley, in his prepared remarks to the Senate, said that uh, President Xi's goal uh, for his military is by 2027 to have his military to, to the level that they could invade Taiwan. Um, later, he said that uh, they may not get there. So two questions. A, from your point of view, from the Pentagon's point of view, why is China's military not at a point now that it could invade Taiwan until 2027? And why, what do you see happening that might cause General Milley or Secretary Austin to say that they may not get there even by 2027? Well, there's an awful lot there. I mean, again, uh, uh, you're right to put a fine point on it, Jen. What the chairman said was that the, the President Xi himself has said they want to have that capability by 2027, not necessarily that they have the intent to act on that capability by 2027. I think in order to answer your question fully, we'd be getting very quickly into a classified realm, and so I, I, I think we need to be careful here uh, at the podium talking about, uh, uh, about the, the kinds of capabilities that the, that the Chinese are, uh, are trying to advance. Um, uh, with that and with other, uh, in other regards in the Indo-Pacific in terms of their co coercion and, uh, and aggressive activities. I think, um, largely speaking, um, in addition to offensive capabilities, and you've seen them exercise amphibious, right? You've seen them conduct uh, bomber patrols. You've seen them now build and put to sea, you know, uh, indigenous aircraft carriers. So offensive power projection capabilities. You've also seen them develop uh, over many years what we call, it's a, 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 a Pentagon sort of ism, but anti-area access denial capabilities. What that means is they're built, they're, they're trying to uh, accumulate uh, standoff capabilities to prevent uh, other militaries, including the United States, from from physical access uh, to whatever territorial claims they might they might make, and so it's a combination of these kinds of capabilities that I think we're watching, both offensive and anti-area access denial denial capabilities. Um, now, uh, what would throw them off schedule? I mean, um, uh, it could be any number of things, including economic challenges. I mean, they're not immune, very not immune to. Uh, to the international economy, and that can have an effect on, just like it has an effect on every nation, uh, on, in terms of building up defense capabilities. Um, uh, what we're doing um, is just, to, uh, again, there's no indication that, uh, that they intend to do that by that or any other date, just that they've stated they want to have the capability. Uh, what we're focused on is making sure that 
we have appropriate capabilities to meet our security commitments uh, in the region, uh, and we have five of our seven treaty alliances are there. We take those seriously. And so, again, I you know, point you to that budget. There is an awful lot in that budget, including a record uh, number of uh, dollars invested in science and technology uh, research uh, going forward to try to make sure that we, too, have the capabilities to meet those commitments. Uh, and, uh, and again, the last thing I'd say is, the Secretary said this many times, there's no reason for cross-strait tensions to turn into conflict. No reason whatsoever. We continue to support the One China policy. The uh, Secretary made that clear when he talked to Minister Wei not long ago. And uh, we continue to support Taiwan and their ability to, to have uh, their own intrinsic self-defense capabilities. Th those efforts are going to continue. And we've also said and continue to say that we don't want to see the status quo change un unilaterally in a military way. Yeah, Louis. Uh, John, um, how much is left in the presidential drawdown authority uh, funding? Is it three hundred million? Is it one hundred million? It's about two hundred fifty uh, million dollars. Is there a possibility of an additional announcement of a new PDA? Uh, well, look, I mean, we still have that. We still have some some money left in drawdown authority, um, uh, and I would certainly expect that you will see us want to use that authority. But I don't have any announcements to speak to from the podium right now, um, and. Again, I'd point you to knowing we were getting close to the end. The, that's why the president acted as early as he did to submit a new supplemental request so that um, uh, if, if Congress can act quickly on that, we can keep these drawdown authorities going without interruption because clearly the war is not being interrupted and uh, we want to make sure we're as fleet of foot to help uh, Ukraine as they have been on the battlefield. Can you expand a little on what Dr. O'Connor was talking about the new but Dr. Lepin was talking about this new, um, the additional 17 million for the switchblades. I mean, does that equate to a numerical quantity? I mean, what? Uh... Well, I think uh, what, what he was referring to was uh, dollars matched to the 700 that we've committed. So we've committed uh, to providing 700 switchblade uh, systems to Ukraine. There's a uh, hundred of them in country right now, and he, I think, he racked and stacked where the rest of it was coming from. Yeah, Kelly. Um, John, the U.S. is supplying Ukraine with weapons, intelligence, training. While there are no U.S. troops on the ground, is this turning into somewhat of a proxy war between the U.S. and Russia? The U.S. has been clear it's not trying to escalate its involvement to provoke Putin, but where is the line there? Everything but troops and jets. Could you go elaborate? It, th this is a war that Russia started on Ukraine. It's a war uh, that uh, of choice that Mr. Putin chose to wage against the people of Ukraine, against the Ukrainian armed forces. That's the war. And it doesn't matter how much Mr. Putin wants to advance the rhetoric that it's somehow the West versus Russia or that his national security was threatened. It wasn't. And this war isn't. It's not about the West. It's not about NATO. It's not about the United States. It's about uh, his uh, enmity towards Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. It, it, that, that's the war. That is what's going on right now. Yeah, Abraham. Well, thanks, John. Uh, you often uh, spoke uh, with the Ukraine like uh, battlefield assessment that the war is changing because of the Donbass Eastern Front, different types of weapons, different types of problems. I wondered if you can um, touch on, has the air picture changed? So we heard the other day that there are less Russian sorties. So um, are there less stingers or less air defense systems going in, or is that the same type? What's going on with the air picture? I think you've seen us change our support based on the, the kind of uh, fighting that the Ukrainians are doing and expect to be doing over the, the coming weeks. Um, and as the war migrated uh, more towards a concentration on the Donbass, flat, open land, uh, more rural, uh, more uh, indicative uh, or, or uh, relevant to mechanized warfare and artillery, uh, and we're seeing that happen every day. Uh, artillery barrages, back and forth, quite frankly. Um, so we have modified and tailored the, the packages that we're providing. And uh, uh, when we have additional packages to announce, I think you'll see in them that relevance borne through. Um, as for the air picture, uh, it changes every day in terms of how many sorties the Russians fly. I'll let them speak to their, uh, their air plan. But we continue to see the airspace contested. Uh, we continue to see 
uh, the Ukrainians uh, be very effective in their air defense capabilities, very nimble about that. But yet the Russians, too, have significant air defense coverage over Ukraine. And uh, they do continue to launch both missile strikes as well as uh, 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 fixed manned uh, airstrikes uh, into, uh, into Ukraine. Predominantly, the airstrikes we're seeing, whether they're missile strikes or, uh, or, or drop from an aircraft, um, are happening in what we call the JFO, the Joint Forces Operations Area, basically the Donbass region where the fighting is really going on right now. And also down in Mariupol, even today, they, they continue to pound uh, Mariupol. Um, we uh, continue to observe the same sort of risk aversion uh, out of Russian pilots, as we have seen before. They know that the Ukrainians have effective air defense, and so you don't see them fly very long or very often uh, inside Ukrainian airspace. Uh, they launch their missions and end their missions basically, uh, usually, mostly in, in Russian airspace. But it's very contested, and again, that's a that's a, a real credit to, to how smart and how effective the Ukrainians have been about their air defense. So would you say then that Donbass requires less U.S. air defense assistance? I would, less what, uh, what I would say is what the Donbass requires are the kinds of capabilities we are focused on providing the Ukrainians in these, in these recent weeks. Artillery, long-range fires, uh, uh, these armored personnel carriers, the, the tow vehicles for the howitzers, uh, the 155 rounds. Um, um, the, the, the gun battles are real, and they're happening every day from both sides. That's, uh, that's what this terrain lends itself to. That's what Russian doctrine sort of tends to dominate when they're in this kind of environment. And again, reminding that, that this is an area of Ukraine that both sides have been fighting over now for eight years. They're very familiar with that terrain, and that's what we're seeing uh, used predominantly. I, I won't, I'm not going to say that, that there won't ever be uh, and has never been in the fighting in Donbass a use for short-range air defense. Um, I, I think the, I don't want to speak for the Ukrainians, but I think they would tell you that they're still finding those capabilities uh, very relevant. Uh, but uh, but the, uh, in terms of our uh, flow of support and assistance, we're really trying to tailor it to what they're telling us they need and what they're telling us that they need the most are what we call long-range fires, in this case, artillery. Yep. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back there. Valerie's going to look for the yeah. defense. Um, it's hard to see back there. You're in the okay. dark. I like to sit in shadows, you know. Um, so uh, just a couple of quick follow-up questions. When you were going down your training kind of like over through, over, overview, uh, I didn't hear anything about Phoenix Ghost. Are those in Ukraine, or are those delivered yet, and are Ukrainians being trained on those yet? Uh, let's see. I do not show any of the Phoenix Ghost actually uh, in uh, in in uh, Ukraine yet. And uh, as for training, I know that there was some training done. Yeah, um, there's about 20. And I'm sorry, I missed this when I went down the list. So thank you for calling it out. There's about 20 uh, Ukrainian soldiers that are in their final day of a week-long seven-day. Uh, 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 Phoenix Ghost uh, uh, UAS training course. So, yeah, thanks for... If I could just follow up really quickly. Um, Dr. LaPlante, he talked about an RFP or a series of RFPs that went out and that he had 300 proposals. Do you have any additional information about what sort of strategic objectives did that, you know, the Pentagon is seeking to fill with those and when some decisions might be made? I, I don't. I, I, I couldn't begin to speculate there. Tom? George, you say how many of the 90 howitzers that were promised are in country and also in the fight? And as far as the, I guess, 190,000 rounds that were promised, how many of those are, have arrived? Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, uh, without getting into specific numbers on that, I, 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 the, you can. I, <laughs> yeah. You like that, wouldn't you? Uh, I'm, I, I, the, the, the vast majority of the 90 are, are inside Ukraine, the vast, vast majority, but not, not all of them. And I'm sorry, your second question was? The rounds, 190,000 um, promised. How many are in? Yeah. Uh, so I'd say uh, I'd put it at roughly 60% of the 144,000 rounds that we had committed over two PDAs, but 60% are in there, are actually in it. 
Okay, I got time for just a couple more. Then we got to reset the room for Mr. Burns's farewell. Yeah, John. John, you noted that uh, about 20 Ukrainian soldiers are about to wrap up their week-long training course for Phoenix Ghost. Um, do you have any um, sort of, you know, window for when you expect those systems to be delivered? I would think that if they're about to finish training, they're probably yeah, getting ready. I, I just don't. I don't have an estimate on here. I mean, I, I can kind of tell you where we're at on a given day, but I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't have access to the logistical plan. I, I couldn't give that to you. But obviously, we... We, we certainly want to get them to them as soon as we can, as soon as it's practical, and make sure that uh, uh, that the individuals trained on it are, 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 are able to fall in if they can on, on, on equipment. If not, we want to close that gap as much as possible. And will there be another cohort going through that, like, a seven-day course? I don't have any reports of another one. It wouldn't surprise me. But uh, if there is, we'll certainly talk about it. But I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not tracking another one. But uh, it would at all not not surprise me because you know we we want to as we're doing with the howitzers you want to keep that training going okay all right i think i already got you i you i got you i told you i'll take your question i'll no, take your question, a separate question just a separate i'll take that one too i'm just kidding go ahead <laughs> okay the, the lead inspector general had a report about oir Who? the the chief inspector like dod inspector general okay had a report on the OIR area of operation. And then in that report, there is an assessment that the DIA assessed that actually Iranian-backed militias are cooperating with PKK in Iraq and Syria to attack Turkish positions. Uh, do, are you aware of that assessment? And uh, what does the, this building plan to do with that assessment? No, I don't have any detail on that particular assessment. Therefore, I'm not going to, and I certainly, even if I did, I would not speculate or talk about future operations. You know, we're not going to do that. Uh, let's take one more from the phone here. Uh, let's see, uh, Paul Hanley. Hi, John. Can you hear me? Maybe you don't have me. Okay, must be a sign. It's Friday. We'll cut it. Uh, we'll cut it short there. Thanks very much. Appreciate uh, you coming today, and uh, have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday.